If I stand here, can they see me? Yeah, you can. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Penny Hamrick, the interim dean of the School of Education, and we're honored and thrilled today um, to for our guest, um, Pedro Rivera, the Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, he is our Dean's Lecture Series speaker today. It's our last um, Dean's Lecture Series uh, speaker for the year, so way to end the year. Um, before I turn it over to um, Secretary Rivera, I would like to read a little bit about his bio. Pedro Rivera was nominated by Governor Tom Wolf to serve as the Secretary of Education on January 20th, 2015, and it was confirmed by the State Senate in June of 2015. He joined the Wolf administration after serving as superintendent 
of the School District of Lancaster, a position he held from 2008 to 2015. Under Rivera's leadership, the School District of Lancaster developed and implemented a new curriculum, an aggressive professional development plan, and innovative classroom observation tools. These initiatives resulted in an increased graduation rate, notable improvements in math, science, and writing proficiency scores, and enhanced the level of participation from high-performing students in programs to help prepare them for college and other post-graduation opportunities. In September of 2014, Rivera was honored by the White House as a champion of change for our efforts for, to transform urban education, one of the 10 recipients nationwide to receive this prestigious honor. He brings extensive experience in public education to his role as a member of Governor Wolf's cabinet and has spent his entire career helping students. Prior to serving as superintendent of the school district of Lancaster, he served as a classroom teacher, staff member in the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers, assistant principal, principal, and executive director of the school district of Philadelphia. Wow. We are honored and humbled um, by your presence and we look forward for your presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, we can do it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And that was my fault. I was giving my back as, as I was walking up. I was, I was processing at the same time. It's always hard to read the bio because um, it almost seems as if you can't keep a job, right? Um, <laughs> just trying to keep going on and, and on. But you know, as you know, you know, any of you who've been in education, you know that in education, you kind of fill. Um, Many times you fill the gap, you know, where needed. And, and you know, I always like to share for the first half of my career, I worked as hard as I could and I was given great opportunities to lead and to grow and to educate. And then someone came along and said, All right, you now go fix this issue and this problem. Um, and, um, and, and I've been fortunate enough to um, sometimes say right to all the right opportunities, mm -hmm. say yes to all the right opportunities, but then, uh, you know, really spend my career. Um, serving kids and, and trying to make a difference in, in the lives of students from early childhood all the way through higher ed. So, so that's what I'm going to, to focus um, a lot of what I share today. Number two, uh, I don't like to uh, you know speak for long periods of time, so I'm only going to kind of give a quick overview presentation, kind of share with you some some of uh, what's on the horizon, um, and then open it up for. Um, questions and, and you know hopefully you know some answers even hear some thoughts that you may have. Now full disclaimer my answer the answers to questions are usually a lot longer than my answer <laughs> so clearly so, because I kind of feel like you have to be comprehensive in terms of the answer because we want folks walking away um, you know not knowing what the heck this guy is talking about. So before we get started I always I, you know I like this is you know we just celebrated um, educator appreciation um, you know, uh, Teacher Appreciation Day and Education uh, Appreciation, um, you know, week and month. So I, I wanted to start the off with at least arrive, students oh, learn and grow. They are part of a community where they feel safe, supported, accepted, and welcome. They can be creative and have fun. You do much more than teach. You create environments that inspire success. You empower students to follow their dreams. You prepare students to graduate college, career, and community ready. You encourage students to believe in themselves and their futures. There are thousands of school that teach across Pennsylvania. Each one impacts every student who learns and grows there. And each educator makes a difference that lasts today tomorrow and forever. So so thanks for, for allowing me um, to take a minute to, to share um, that video for two reasons. One uh, most importantly, we just celebrate our teachers because um, I know they really care about us. There we go. Thanks. 
say, I am an all-purpose speaker here. I am I am what you like to call in our world a really cheap saint. Uh, so I just do it all. Um, so number is one I, I love to, to start off with that video because it really captures uh, you know the celebration of all things education, all things education. Um, you know, we, we quite often we think about education. Um, you know, folks are always kind of hyper focused unless you're you're really deeply in that field on what happens uh, with the students in front of the classroom and, and what happens you know in the lecture hall in front of uh, you know in front of your students or, or what happens online and, you know in many cases and. You know, you tend to forget in this world of you know, it's all encompassing. I mean, it's you know what you do before and after the reflection that you have as, as part of the process, and then ultimately how delivery impacts practice, and that changes each and every day. I mean, if you think about it, you know, as quickly as this world is changing, content is changing, narrative and verbiage you know, are changing, then then what we do in front of our you know students and our main speakers all the way through. Um, our adult learners um, has to evolve, uh, you know, along with, with the contextual opportunities of, you know, today's world. So with all of that in mind, I'll share with you a little bit about the um, Department of Education. So, so the so PDE, the Pennsylvania Department of Education, um, we're a relatively large agency in terms of our reach. Um, we partner with the Department of Human Services to um, provide um, educational <coughs> opportunities for our younger students in pre-K count. And head start. So kids that are from three to five years old, we like to identify that as, as uh, um, kindergarten ready. And then before that, we provide some assistance in terms of the educational narratives from birth um, to pre, in terms of early intervention, um, providing service for the students. We then provide opportunity service and, and support to our K-12 system. So there are 1.74 million students that are in uh, K-12 in Pennsylvania, and you may have heard of the 500 school districts. 499 of them are locally elected school boards. Uh, one is a, a, you know, a mayor appointed school board here in Philadelphia. We have uh, about a little, little over 175 charter schools um, across the Commonwealth. We have intermediate units, career technical education centers, uh, and some private licensed schools as well. We also provide support and service to higher ed um, the state system of higher ed. Uh, Bloomsburg, Millersville, um, Cheney University, um, the state related universities, Penn State, Lincoln, uh, Temple, and Pitt, and then our community colleges, um, as well as technical colleges, Washington College and Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology. And then when you think of some of our um, you know, oldest uh, community learners, we also provide support service to our public libraries. So there are about 604 public libraries um, across the country. So we think of all things education, for being able to provide, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, the connectivity, the connection to, to learners across the world. We like to share. You know, we're birth through um, not birth, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, through, through, our own, through our oldest learners. And you know, it's amazing because when you think about, as you heard, our vision to ensure all students are college, career, and community ready. As a, you know, as I shared, the evolution of education, responsibility put on educators, and the fact that, you know what, we need to identify that as part of our mission because if we're going to ensure we, we have we connect and, and prepare our learners to do all three, um, you know, you heard the, the adage, it takes a village, it's going to take everyone to come to the table to support this cause and to support this mission, which is why I'm really proud of under uh, the current governor and the governor Wolf, we've really broken down some of the barriers and we've worked across the agency to provide supports for, for community employment. I'll share with you a little bit um, in that area. So what drives us? You know, so you, you figure when you think about um, those of you who are going to be leaders, those of you who are going to engage, um, whether it's in education, whether it's uh, you know in the workforce through service, whether it's through, through business, uh, you know, or entrepreneurship, you know, you kind of first thing you want to do um, is ask yourself, you know, why do you want to do what you do? Why do you why do you take the path um, that you've chosen? What do you ultimately hope to accomplish? And we realize in government agencies, um, quite many times they don't start with their why. Uh, you know, and as you know, you share as, as you heard, you know, having been a teacher and an administrator and kind of working the system, one of the first 
thing that I started with in my classroom on Southern Bush Runners was a learning event because I knew that if I put up on the board what my students would expect to learn today, not only you know, was I holding them accountable to, to what I expected them to learn, but I was holding myself accountable as to what I was going to teach for that day. And sometimes I walk away saying, man, I nailed it. And other times I've said, you know, I better put that objective on the board again tomorrow. I oh, and I bomb that lesson. But you know, that's one of the beauties of education and leadership. You can self-reflect and then come back and um, redefine and re-identify uh, you know your objective or, or what your plan is for, you know, for what in terms of your goals. And what we've done in the Department of Education is we've we've adopted post-secondary attainment goals. Uh, a post-secondary attainment goal uh, specifically, but what, um, what we said we were going to do in 2025, we were going to ensure that 60% of the Commonwealth residents had some form of post secondary English teaching certificate, two year degree, or four year degree, uh, with a focus on underrepresented communities. Now, in the department that we like to say, we set the, we set the conditions for learning um, of students across the Commonwealth through the focus on, on equity. Let me start off by detailing where they say. Uh, with a focus on underrepresented communities, we are intentional in identifying the lens of equity. And by equity, we mean making the resources, opportunities, and supports available to students when they need them and how they need them to be successful. And whether that's academic rigor, systems of support, systems of connectivity, and the operative word there is how to use them when they need them in the manner that we need them. Not when we feel like we need them. Because far too often we talk about equity. And like, yes, I believe in equity. And I understand your struggle. So come see me from eight to nine on Tuesday, and I will, you know, provide my equitable opportunity for you to play. Yeah, good. If one, they don't show up, because you don't know what else is going on in their, in their lives, we create this almost this system of having half not. So we're, we're looking through that lens of equity. We identified 60% because we know. In the next 10 years, we ran some, some research with third party. Um, we know that uh, over 60% of jobs, 62% of jobs in the Commonwealth are going to require some type of post secondary degree, industry cert, two year degree, four year degree. We know that 99% of STEM related jobs are going to require an industry certificate, two year degree, or four year degree. Yet at the time when we adopted this goal, only 40% of Commonwealth residents between the ages of all those degrees. So we can. Now, if we were really putting ourselves on the spot by saying, especially for this education, saying, this is, this is what we've done, here's where we need to, to, to go. But let's push our goal forward so we can solicit support, but also hold ourselves accountable, not only myself accountable, but my president to them. I'm going to hate you. I'm going to say, what the hell is this guy thinking? Um, because now there's a number of so we were really proud, we, we hit this mark, and we grew that number to 43%. And then uh, this year we looked at a number that was closer to 47%, and you know, we had to you know, ourselves so back to so a little bit moment, and yeah, we may meet this goal earlier than we really did. Um, and then we remind the men that, and then we were going to focus on the rest of the team. So we decided to be and we saw that um, you know, our neighbors in the black community were only about 23 percent post secondary. Our neighbors in the ideal community were only about 23 percent um, you know, post secondary. And we realized, you know what? You know, we're not meeting our goal of serving and providing better opportunities for, um, you know, our underrepresented communities, you know, for our communities of color. And a lot of that starts with getting folks in front of the table. So we started in drug selection, one of our significant partners to, to look at diversifying and enriching the student pipeline. We know that if a teacher, if a student has a teacher of diversity in the color program, the more likely not only to be successful, but they're going to be on the advantage of other resources in the class. And not to give that to them, every student, you know, it just benefits from having a diverse educator firm. We also knew that we had to diversify our teachers around the the Catholic community. So, had a lot of those options with us. We also knew that we, need, we had to do some um, STEM opportunities and, and um, opportunities within the STEM. So, we created um, what 
probably identify that as an ecosystem response, but you know, have a cost of time on this. And so you was one of our first Pittsburgh, uh, you know, one of the first. And now we're number two in terms of the number of seven ecosystems in the country and <coughs> California. And that's a, a great distinction. And trust me, we we're trying to find ways to bump California on that stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, we may not have as many, uh, you know, we may not be as, as, as sexy as they are in this world, but we're going to beat them in terms of the data. <laughs> um, so, so when you look uh, at you know, specifically at the work um, that we did to engage and um, embed it, it's not only looking at you know providing equitable and environments, but it's about creating a trajectory so that we can be on the front of bringing in other supports um, into our systems of education and other educational communities as well. And I'll take a couple minutes to share with you what that means. So, we've been working with the Department of Human Services. So we realize they have a goal, they have um, you know, a vision of providing um, you know, systems of support as it relates to um, determinants of health you know, for, for families across, across, the, uh, across the continent, um, you know, across the country. And but we realized kids were not showing up to appointments or missing appointments or missing school because they were you know, help, you know, you know, fulfilling their, their health obligations. So we have been working with them to provide mental health services on school. You know, on campus, on site, um, you know, for students and families while they're there. We actually wrote a grant um, for, uh, you know, Philly 191 Road in Pittsburgh, um, you know, for, for students to put health plans um, in school. So they identified that area to be uh, you know, the area that had the most significant amount of super users and emergencies. So they asked, you know, how can we lower the number of students going, the number of kids going to the emergency room with primary care for them? Well, why don't we put clinics you know, in our schools to provide that, that system of support? And 191 Pro is starting to already do the difference. I love to say 191 Pro, but I just have to tell you what that I grew up with. So it's like, you know, double, uh, you know, equally as proud to, to be able to provide uh, you know, that system of support. We're looking at labor and industry. Uh, you know, we, we've been providing workforce development centers in our public libraries. Because in some of our rural communities, when folks don't have access, um, you know, to the internet, to Wi Fi, or just to find resources, you go to your public libraries. That sounds like a no brainer, but no one's on the phone, not doing it. So while they're there, they can connect with the librarian who works with me, um, you know, around uh, job readiness, uh, you know, skills training, um, and some even just to show folks how to write a resume, um, how to connect to the, you know, to, to job, um, you know, website apps, or, you know, to, to do some meaningful. Um, you know, research around that. And so our libraries are starting to connect um, in that area. Working with the Department of Corrections, um, we actually just started providing career and technical education um, program, well, enriching, making, uh, providing more robust um, CP type programs um, in our prisons. So I used to sit there with when I, I, I started the conversation and say, this is how I grew up in Philly and I you know, live in, um, you know, live in Niger. Most of my barbers receive the barbering certificate while incarcerated. So why not our plumbers and our electricians and our you know carpenters? Why not our undergraduate you know degree holders and, and PhD program holders and, and beyond? We know that many of them are capable. We need the opportunity, so we're working with our department of corrections to build those types of things. Um, and something as simple as still feeding center in our in our women's prisons. So when the families come to the library, we have the Place that actually looks healthy in terms of preventing sustained and, um, and literacy um, accordingly. So, so we've been working across the agency to fulfill this mission. For me, it's about that post-secondary attainment goal, right? Ensuring that over 60% of child prisoners hold some, some type of certificate degree, um, you know, and um, focusing on those kinds of underserved communities. In order to do that, we need leaders and partners from all of um, you know, the business industry sector and all across, the social sector all across, government sector, healthcare, um, to identify opportunities and focus those folks that, but quite frankly, even know the system of human resources. And that's kind of where my narrative is. If you think about that. And whenever you have the opportunity to make those connections, not just reach out, but to kind of think bigger and broader, um, try. Step forward and take an opportunity that exists that you love. Um, you know, to make that one of the things that, that, we, that we're not uh, we're not short of a really smart people 
um, has been a lot of really strong support and support and courage and brave enough to cross into a room and come to my and, and say, I want to provide support and services to you when you need them, how you need them, and letting them know about it. Um, so that's kind of what we do in the Commonwealth and um, our mission. <laughs> All right, so you guys know I'm like a 45-minute guy to get really bored. Um, yeah. so, so um, I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and go
Absolutely. So, so I'm going to give three really important quick answers because as, as you're connecting with that spirit, there's probably someone in the energy you're connecting. So I'm going to give you three Um, third grade reading level attainment, 
own caregivers, their own, they kind of need to have creative problem solving skills in order to manage how to pursue these different tracks, uh, stack of credits, the stack of credentials. It kind of brings into mind that teachers need to be teaching creative problem skills in the classroom. And yet, there's really not a standard in the teacher education curriculum regarding creativity and innovation. Are there any plans of putting that into the, uh, to the standard? And so, what can you do to support that? So, of course, everything I explained is not about the student having to be creative to access it. It's about saturating the field so that if every student has access, I think that's part of the problem. But it's not the mannequin. Well, yeah, and honestly, your the other part is the, the, the question is why. Well, but I want to be really clear. Part of the system, all of this stuff is the same. But because it's so difficult to leverage many of these resources, we get super users, we just look at that access. And they create, and that's why you know, the, the equity matters. Now, to your question, um, changing uh, teacher preparation programs to be um, a little more focused on, on um, you know, just development and the, the cognitive and non cognitive development. Board right now, and the state board of education, is in the process of um, adopting an updated chapter 49. Chapter 49 are, are, is the red that takes place for future prep programs. Um, and you can look this up online, you can even provide comment on it for those of you who are interested. Um, what some of the recommendations that have been um, consistent around that have been. Um, the need to, to teach um, common form instruction. Um, the need to teach um, uh, cultural um, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion um, you know, methodology around, you know, around how to engage in that life. And then the last is you know, what we might have remembered when we were younger around the critical thinking skills and how it's around uh, what we actually are calling this. Um, this Political connotation on some of it, so we're calling it workforce readiness. So, so if you look at our matrix online and what workforce readiness skills are, it's everything you just mentioned. That you know, they're, they're all you know, really high leverage, you know, processing and thinking skills. You know, really are. They you know, used to call them um, soft skills or social emotional mm -hmm. skills or you know, critical thinking skills. Yeah. Um, some individuals saw that.
know how to, how to tackle that issue, but our higher ed partners and their community members, um, what they serve their community. So they've been, so they've been uh, sending us those apps and, and we've been improving and providing funding. We, but we also realized that there are two, one, it's okay. I know what's happening, but I won't touch that one right now. <laughs> um, but we do know there are two other major you know, issues that, that um, impact each of those. One, um, leadership, and just leadership, and um, sense of community. Um, so we, Pennsylvania Inspired Leadership with co programs and Prince School Improvement Fund, we, we created three or four more modules. One, um, local competency and uh, equity and inclusion um, practices. Uh, second, uh, coaching, um, you know, how to create a learning community, how to engage um, you know, teachers in, in, in a coaching model, inclusive of leadership. And then the last is, is just um, you know, student and um, academic development. So folks know how to have a big, big conversation around our you know, classroom practice. We also created the first in the country, and we may still be the only one, but we had a number of different things. We had the superintendent retreat. And uh, a number of years ago, we started it with a focus um, on low socioeconomic and um, you know, underrepresented and uh, quote unquote at risk communities. And we brought um, you know, 30, 40 um, superintendents and again, to learn, um, you know, international, national practice, Pennsylvania practice, and create an out and action learning process culminating in our successful school year. And many of those projects have been around, um, you know, teacher retention um, and um, growing the pipeline. And then we, we publish that for everyone, uh, you know, all of their colleagues. So we're now in round three, round three of the, uh, of the Superintendent Academy. Um, you know, as we're looking at 100 you know, superintendents that have gone through it, and Dr. Ike um, here is in cohort two with me in this team. Um, and, uh, and the practice has been amazing. And the, his out um, is around um, uh, classroom observation, how to provide meaningful feedback to you know, the teachers of your classroom. So as we know, it's a thing and thing around retention, but also improving practice. Even your best teachers don't know, you know whether or not you're going to be um, But you have to know how to tell them. Um, you know, they're, they're doing a good job of reaching out to some of these young people. And um, all of that kind of that. So, um, then we have the quick restart. We're working on the regs, you know, for uh, um, teachers and programs, and we're working on salary. And, and But two biggest indicators are the regs. Well, what has been done to kind of work on yeah. So, first, everything I shared earlier, um, as we went around the, um, the Commonwealth, and, and uh, we brought cases here after you know the mass shootings and the mass protests, the proposed task force led by the governor and the auditor general. Um, the, the number one is within seconds of the student sharing is the number one need. Um, so that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm pushing heavily the mental health service classes to get, you know, trained counselors to get um, social support services, and not overextending the budgets of the school, finding other resources to kind of push. It. The school has to focus first and foremost on on instruction, on systems, and what other systems are supposed to wrap around. So that's that's number one. Um, we have to give adults some time to connect with teachers. Uh, Share my personal story here. You know, I was a superintendent of high school and taught, um, you know, there, and, and then I went over to elementary school at Shale. Um, I was able to mitigate more acts of violence than my team. I should say, our team was able to mitigate more acts of violence, fights, and just by standing in front of the building in the morning and saying good morning and, and shaking hands and getting out and talking about some of my other days. And, and you know, unfortunately, we've kind of created this culture so stressed and, and you know, so busy that they no longer take the time to connect with our students. And, and so that's one big, you know, initiative uh, that we're continuing to try to support and implement. The second, of course, is um, you know, we have to look at uh, providing funding for um, school safety equipment and, and you know, professionals and those to mitigate, uh, you know, some of those acts of violence if they if they were um, to occur. 
So we do have um, 50 grants uh, uh, um, we, we wrote it into the planning construction plan, a uh, small percentage of that which will get the equipment. And then we work with our PCPD that will bring the um, commission on crime and delinquency um, and provide them some of that financing process. So we try to take a, a, a full, you know, circle approach, but you know, I, I think if you, know, if you ask the question and you can have it because it's so interesting, it's about that relationship uh, between you know, the trained, caring adults. And, um, and the students that we're interpreting. And the point of attention has one of these things. So it's not quite enough. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Not enough. Um, <laughs> and seriously, not, not enough because we're, we're just doing that. One of the things we were able to do, um, you know, with the, with the government, with the governor's push and everything, we created the uh, community in the workplace. Not, you know, very easy to do it, right? Um, so workplace, workforce management, industry partners can apply through the workforce development uh, board or, or others to um, to write a grant to bring teachers into a professional development program, you know, over the summer. Um, or even throughout the year, so teachers coming into industry learning around what the needs of industry are so they can integrate um, their, uh, their lesson modules around, around those specific needs. But you know, it's been interesting because by doing that, we're creating these community partnerships that you know, go far beyond just that specific development um, issue. And I, and I like to say, you know, at the lowest level, it finally gives the high school math teacher the experience to say, here's why you have to because <laughs> right? you know you always hear, why do I have to learn how to Well, I just you know point that this was that you know an industry, and here's where I use those number one skills. Um, and, and it was amazing. I, I, I get to do this thing all the time. Um, and even what I learned, um, you know, about uh, uh, you know, just our industry. Last time I got to go to Casey Home, the biggest manufacturer in the world of autonomous tractors. Okay, so if you think the Tesla school. I see a tractor, I can do all this stuff. It's just right here in Pennsylvania. And you know, the teacher's got to walk in and say, We thought you, you just made tractors here. Right? So, all the different pathways, um, you know, that they're preparing students for for you know, job in that, in that plant, um, it really uh, you know, enriched the, the opportunity. I think more importantly, it gave the industry leader the opportunity to say, Here's what I need. And then we know the next generation will. We have time for one more question, and then um, we can have about 30 minutes to engage in formal. Yeah. All right, I'm going to let you pick the last one. I'm not going to now. No, that was the only one I saw. Sorry. <laughs> um, so it kind of piggybacks on the last talk. Next point. Um, when I was in 
Brad Cole, one of my favorite moments of our Trying to create differentiators, um, for example, around the graduation requirements, um, which, which we post on. And we know that there are a number of, of charter schools um, that we use as a case um, to, to look at uh, what a seven year graduation looks like for a foundation student and, and, and allow that to be an allowable factor when you're looking at CSI and comprehensive support schools and, and um, um, and um, it was just not, you know, the federal law was all or nothing. And, and so I have to make a decision to allow for, you know, a, a multi-year graduation requirement, but then it's for everyone and then water down the system of accountability for traditional folks. I will never do because we need to have a strong system of accountability for, you know, for, for the traditional population. You know, if you're expensive, if you move, depending on your way, and struggle over the course of, you know, the year and make a decision. Around um, you know what um, you know what does the system of accountability look like, especially for schools that serve our most vulnerable students. However, uh, system of accountability what we were able to do is allow for differentiators around the country. So what will come in in the next year or two? Future APA umbrella system of accountability. What we measure, what we don't focus on, focus on everything that you mentioned earlier. The comprehensive plan will identify how you're going to use those strategies, but will also allow you to provide intervention and enrichment strategies for those students who may be above or, or below what the expected outcomes are, and what you're going to do to better provide support for those students. So, you may 
may be a student, uh, you may be a school that serves a special student population function where uh, overage, uh, credit, that, that, that. But with the comprehensive one, you may still fall under the qualified. But the sanction that that leads to will be differentiated based on the student population you serve. So, and, and, and as well as growth. I mean, I'll be really, you know, start thinking of one of the biggest, when I talk about some of that themselves, I want to create this new system through the lens of equity, and I focus on subject school. And um, we have some of the highest performing schools in the country have such a significant achievement gap that I identified them for CSI. Because, you know, they're in the 95th percentile in the all student group. And the African American subgroup is under 20 to 30 percent now. You know, we, we, you know, it was a great conversation because the team came together and said, Boy, look. And then I said, All right, well, it's said, Everything we do is through the, you know, through the lens of the focus on equity. Then I called the governor and I said, Hey, heads up. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to know. And, and, you know, but, but fortunate, and, and, you know, the governor was responsible. He said, Well, it's the right thing. I think the right thing to do is identify them for, for ATSI because they're not. You know, meeting all of these two groups. Then we took the next level, and this is kind of the fortune for us, our top tier leaders on the Fed for all education. So you know, we picked up the phone and called every other school. I mean, then we yelled, and then, you know, for the most part, we just sit down and say, you know what? You're right. That's what you said. All kids, all kids, all kids. Um, and with the exception of one, they all came around. Um, and the other one, Still kicking his feet, but you know, it is what it is. Not he or she. Um, but, um, but nonetheless, when you look at so that's the system we're trying to create um, in the state level that allows you to at least you know, differentiate around the population that is your mission to serve. Um, and then I'm building a program. So we're, we're trying, but it's so much more now. But I do want to say that the annual argument was a good push to make. Remember nationally, I mean, in a way, in our community that provides more schools. And so you have to have a system of accountability that, first and foremost, no matter what else happens, ensures that our most vulnerable kids are hidden from, you know, from that, from you know, the accountability. And for me, having figured that out, fact, I will side on, on you know, the back of system of caution. Well, thank you. I want to thank you for um, coming. <laughs> and we um, just have a small token of appreciation for your office. For the office. For the office. You can't accept it. But I want to make sure they made a dress up for the office. So thank you so much for and um, ask questions with um, Secretary Rivera if you'd like to um, before we're officially done. So thank you all and uh, please grab some more food, have conversation, dialogue. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 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 <